so much for coming. My name is Pat Benjamin. I teach here in the Department of Earth, Environment, and Physics. And we are very, very honored to have this group of speakers visiting us tonight. So this came together at the last minute. So kudos to you all for uh, figuring out that it was happening and showing up. Yay! <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Yeah. So our, our speakers just drove from New York. And they're doing a flash visit here. They're doing a flash visit, and they're heading east, and they'll be in Boston tomorrow. So this is, uh, you know, they're trying to get the word out. So I just wanted to say a couple of things, and then we'll get started for real. Um, I think what we're going to hear tonight is an opportunity for us to rethink how we conceptualize energy and how we conceptualize how we respond to climate change, okay? Um, do we think we can just keep doing whatever we've been doing for the last 50 years? No. Only a teeny weeny bit greener around the edges? Nope. So, you know, if we think that, then industrial scale hydro, industrial scale solar and wind, as replacements for the phasing out of coal and oil and gas. That would make sense if we think that way. Sorry, I have to look at my notes because I'm so tired. <laughs> However, what we really need to do is to, all of us, work to revisualize what we want our societies to look like how we live in relation to one another, how we live in relation to the earth, and as a piece of that, how we produce energy. So if we started doing that, then we wouldn't be doing what just happened in my town, which is a half hour west of here, where two 15-acre tracts of forest got cut down, clear-cut, so the industrial solar farms could go in. Does that make any sense? No. That's our state policy that's driving that, straight, the state incentive structure. In the same way, um, does it make any sense for our state government to pretend that it's responding to climate change by importing hydropower from Quebec. It's the same logic, correct? So, it seems to me, let me read this, because I was coherent when I wrote it. We need to revision this system to produce energy where it's used, to limit our use to what we can produce locally, um, to create democratically run and distributed energy systems, right? Does that that's what we need to be thinking about, in my opinion. So our guests are here to help us with that work and also to defend their own homes against being treated as a sacrifice zone so that we here in Massachusetts can pretend that we're being sustainable. <coughs> so without any further ado, I want to introduce Meg Sheehan, who's going to set the stage and introduce the other speakers. So uh, what, what's gonna happen is we'll hear from the speakers for about an hour and then we'll have Q&A for as long as people have the energy to do it, okay? Thank you. I'll stand next to you. Okay. Somehow it gives me some confidence. Anyway, thank you everyone for being here. We really appreciate it. This is our third annual Mega Dams Mega Damage Tour. And I got involved in this issue when I found out that Massachusetts was proposing to import this Canadian hydro and I found out where it was coming from. 
So right now, Governor Baker does have a contract in place to import 1,200 megawatts of Canadian hydropower, subsidized and called clean and green. And you might have heard of the controversial central main power transmission corridor that's going from the, the Canadian border through Maine, and it is very controversial there, into Boston so that we can call our electricity clean and green, and so that the governor can pretend that we're a green state. We're already importing Canadian hydropower to the Northeast, to Massachusetts. This has been going on since the 1900s. So this is not like a new innovative kind of energy production method. And you'll hear from the communities here who are from Labrador, where Nalcor Energy operates a 5,000 megawatt dam on the upper Churchill River, also called the Grand River. We have the Grand River Keeper, Roberta. Here from, the, from Labrador, we have Amy Norman from the Labrador Land Protectors, who has been trying to protect her Inuit community from methyl mercury poisoning caused by the second dam on the Grand River, Muskrat Falls. Amy has been jailed and arrested many times as a land protector. Then we have two community members from Pimichikamak Cree, a um, self-determined indigenous nation in Manitoba, who have been fighting Manitoba Hydro since it started to devastate their land about 40 years ago. So they will tell you what Hydro is really like and the economic, social, and environmental impacts on communities a thousand miles away where these dams are located. And I will give you a bit of an overview as to um, the big picture situation. So Canadian Hydro started um, in earnest to be developed in the 1970s and imports started, as I mentioned, about in the 1900s. Many of the dams by Hydro-Quebec, by Nalcor and Labrador, and by Manitoba will, were built on indigenous lands many times without even contacting the indigenous people who had been using these lands for hunting, trapping, fishing, and subsistence for thousands of years. Finally, they reached out and did contact. This would have been in the 70s when the American Indian Movement kind of got going. And then there was a second fleet of dams that was proposed in Quebec by Hydro-Quebec in the 1990s. The Great Whale Project, which I'll talk about and I'll show you about the resistance there in the 1990s that resulted in suspending some of those new dams. Regardless, Hydro-Quebec has continued to build mega dams. And when we talk about mega dams, I wanna talk about what some of these systems are like. So in Quebec province, where Massachusetts already gets some hydropower from and where we would like to get more from under this contract that Governor Baker has signed. Hydro Quebec has 60 generating stations and these are facilities that drain thousands of square miles of land in order to create reservoirs. For example, one of their reservoirs is 36 square miles in area. So that's the scale of it in Manitoba. Manitoba Hydro has flooded 50,000 square miles and reversed the flow of one of Canada's major rivers. In Labrador, on the Grand River, where Hydro-Quebec gets electricity that is fed into its supply for the U.S., it has built in the 1970s the Upper Churchill Falls mega dam that drains another 36,000 square miles and flows into a, a reservoir that is 27,000 square miles. So just think about that for a minute and think about the forests, wetlands, and peatlands that would have had to have been destroyed to create those. And think about the fact that that scale of destruction and building of these mega dams is still going on. And there is a proposal, which Roberta will talk to you about, the Gull Island proposal that's proposed for the lower part of the Grand River in Labrador, and there are more dams planned and under construction in Quebec province. So the proposed dams are being, and the old dams, are being promoted by, by Hydro-Quebec as clean and green. You can go on their website. In some instances, they even have the nerve to call it carbon-free. It's anything but. 
Recent science, a peer-reviewed report that came out last week, says that hydropower on this scale, particularly because of the large reservoirs, can be as dirty as coal. The reservoirs emit methane, three times the greenhouse gas impact of CO2. Yet, Hydro-Quebec will continue to tell regulators that they're going to help us reduce our carbon emissions if we would only replace our power, our fossil fuel power, with hydropower. It's a falsehood. So that's in part of what our tour is about. You'll also hear Hydro-Quebec and the other hydro industry companies calling it renewable. We are here to tell you that our rivers, our communities, and our forests and peatlands that have been destroyed are not renewable. Our indigenous speakers will tell you about their relationship to the land and how because they are so remote, and here I should show you my slide. Um, I'll, I do, I'll divert for a minute. But so this goes to the point of what hydropower will claim. They will, they're, for every claim to ver, for every claim to virtue made by the proponents of, a, of big dams, there is clear cut factual and demonstrable re, reputa, uh, reputation. So this is in 1954. The story is the same. The production method is the same. There's nothing new. So when we talk about where, we're, where we are, we're talking about bringing energy from a thousand, over a thousand miles away. You can see uh, Hudson Bay there, the James Bay dams and Hydro Quebec and the Quebec province is up there that way. If you look over to the east, you can see Labrador and, and Roberta will tell you more about that. So across Canada, from the west, from British Columbia, where there's a very controversial dam being built, Site C, all across this land, there has been devastation by the hydro, hydro industry for the last 100 years. And just to summarize before we get into um, the stories from um, Pemichick and Mag and Labrador, so, you can go online and read this, but Hydro-Quebec will tell you that they consult with indigenous nations, that they talk to them, and so forth. In 2017, when there was a lot of opposition in New Hampshire to the Northern Pass, Chief Simon from the Pessimid Cree in Quebec, whose lands were taken in the 1970s prior to any kind of consultation, explained that 29% of the electricity that Hydro-Quebec sells, whether to Boston or New York, still originates from Pessimist territory where there was never any consent given, no compensation, no com consultation. So in his view, that electricity is still owned by the Pessimist nation. You might ask, how does, how does this happen? Well, these corporations across the country are crown corporations. That means they're owned by the state. They have a monopoly. Their investment decisions are based on politics and not on what's best for the climate or what's best for the local communities. The disproportionately impacted frontline communities have very little say in this process. And yet here we are in the US being complicit in using these megawatts from these communities who bear the brunt of the impacts. And one of our indigenous community members in our alliance calls these blood, blood megawatts. And I can only agree, and I think after you hear from our speakers, you will understand what they're talking about. And one of the impacts that they will talk to you about is about methyl mercury poisoning, and they can explain how that happens. Um, I refer to the greenhouse gas emissions. This is the title of the study, if you would like to look at that. Um, and our community members from Manitoba are from the community of Cross Lake. There are mountains of studies that show the negative impacts of large hydro. So this is not a new issue. The evidence is there, and yet we're constantly having to refute and rebut the claims that this is clean, green, and renewable. 
And one of the studies is specifically about cross lake rock also from, and it talks about how destroying the hunting, trapping, fishing, and food gathering lands of indigenous, indigenous nations leads to food insecurity and a host of diseases related to that. This is a picture of New York City in Earth Day. On Earth Day, there was a proposal at the time for Hydro-Quebec to export about 1,000 megawatts of hydropower to New York City. And this time, the Cree in Quebec rose up. They, the, that first set of dams had been built in the 1990s without their consultation, without their knowledge, until it was almost too late and the dam was already built. This time, 60 Cree and Inuit took a hybrid canoe that they built called an Odiac, and they came down to New York City and they paddled the Hudson River to um, protest this. And so this is the same thing that is happening today. In 1990, the Governor Cuomo, Mayor Mario, sorry, Governor Mayor, Governor Mario Cuomo rejected that contract, New York City, when they listened to the stories of these folks, said, no way, we're not buying it. So that's what we're asking you to do today, is to say no. And you'll hear about this social phenomenon um, called so slow violence. And it's the type of environmentalism that's often associated with poor communities who cannot, have not had the chance to resist and stop uh, destruction in their communities. It actually probably relates to a lot of us who can understand this, but it's a gradual kind of violence um, when you have to watch your homelands or a place that you care about be destroyed. So our theme is that we're asking you to reject Canadian Hydro. We hope you will. We're on Facebook at Resist Megadams. We're on Twitter and we have a website called www. Northeast Megadam, Megadam, Northeast Megadam Resistance org, and we'll be here for a while to answer any questions. I will introduce the next speaker, who is Roberta Benefield. She's here from Labrador to talk to you about. The Grand River in Labrador, also called the Churchill River, where there are now two mega dams and one in the works. Thank you, Meg, and uh, oh boy, I'm glad to see a lot of young people here tonight. We're all, you can see we're all, all except one of us is either graying or gray already, and I see there's lots of you in the uh, audience, so That's I'm it. glad to see lots of young people, because we need to turn this over to you folks, because you're the ones that are going to have to deal with this. So I want to just talk to you about why Canadian Hydro is not the answer to climate change, and Meg has already mentioned the fact that you know, the destructed forests and fish and fish habitat, those will never come back, they're not renewable. So the Churchill Falls project was 5,400 megawatts of power and it came on stream in the early 1970s. It's contracted to Hydro-Quebec until 2041 and a contract that was signed in 1969. So basically, um, our community had to get in the streets and scream and even go 600 miles to St. John's to our seat of government to even get 77 of those megawatts uh, brought in to our community, which was on diesel at the time this project came on stream. That happened, we still have about 20 communities in Labrador on the coast that are still on diesel. And we now have another project, 824 megawatts, about ready to go on stream at Muskrat Falls. And you may have heard about uh, Muskrat Falls being called a boondoggle. Well, it is more than a boondoggle, it's even worse than that. So map, the map that I've got up there is basically pretty much what Meg had up there, so I'll skip over that. Here's a picture of our river actually from the Smallwood Reservoir, which is up in the far left corner there and the Churchill Falls project where, um, where that uh, 
is turbined uh, is at the beginning of the river and you follow it down to Happy Valley Goose Bay and just above Happy Valley Goose Bay you see Muskrat Falls. That project is finished within 99%. Uh, they can't get the uh, transmission um, turned over to operate properly yet, but that'll probably happen within the next year. So what we're concerned about right now is, is the third one, which is up in the middle there, the second dock from uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, which is Gull Island. That's 2,200 megawatts. To begin with, 824 megawatts we don't need in Labrador or Newfoundland. So 170 of that has been given to a company called Amira. It also has uh, people in the United, uh, a company in the United States. Uh, they will sell that power down here more than likely. And then we have about another 200 megawatts that will be sold down here because we don't need it. It's just not needed. So then you ask the question, why do we want to build another 2200 megawatt project? It's not hard to figure out. They intend to sell it to you. Let me tell you what the Muskrat Falls project is going to cost the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. 65 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, I don't think anybody in this room can even fathom what your utility bill was, would be if you had to pay 65 cents a kilowatt hour. I pay about 3.8 cents myself, and my bill's $400 in January. So if you pay 10 or 11, that's about maximum, maybe 12, maybe even 14 in some places. But this is going to cost the people of Newfoundland and Labrador 65 cents a kilowatt hour. And we're going to sell it down here for about 4 cents. So guess who's going to pay the difference? We own this Crown Corporation, 550,000 of us. It's a publicly owned corporation, or private, no, sorry, public. And we're going to pay the difference. So we're basically going to subsidize the power that comes down here in our rates. And if the rates don't cover the cost of the project, then it goes to our tax bills. This is what Muskrat Falls used to look like when I used to go up there and have a picnic and, you know, it's, it's just gone now. So uh, here are some of the protesters lining the highways. We, we haven't stopped protesting the Muskrat Falls project. Uh, Grand River Keeper was involved in what is now uh, known as the uh, Commission of Inquiry into this project. It went from $6.2 billion up to $12.9 billion. And the government was concerned with how much it had risen in cost, but they were not concerned with the environmental issues. We had to fight and fight hard to even get on as interveners in this project to talk about, only talk about the environmental issues as they related to the costs. This is a, a Beatrice Hunter. She was an Inuit grandmother at some time. She was also. Um, uh, arrested and spent 11 days in jail because of this project. So I just want to go over a few quickly of the negative effects. I've already got my two minute sign, so I know I got to hurry up here. Um, for you folks down here, I think you need to think about what we've learned over the years on the uh, silica problem, the fact that big dams uh, hold silica behind them and therefore silica does not get down into the St. Lawrence River, into the Gulf of Maine, into the Grand, uh, uh, Grand Banks of Newfoundland and the fish are disappearing and we think it's one of the reasons why because silica is what diatoms make their bodies of, and diatoms is what phytoplankton eat, and phytoplankton is what fish eat. And guess what? The fish eat, the, the seals eat the fish, and um, Amy's gonna tell you about the methyl mercury issue. Um, the flooding that, that has happened to one of the communities down in, uh, uh, across the river from us in Mud Lake happened a year and a half ago. Uh, now for did not control the gates properly. This was even before they were finished with the project and people were on their rooftops at two o'clock in the morning getting airlifted out. I have a picture on my other computer but I, I couldn't get it transferred over here. We have an issue with one of the three dams that holds back the, the um, Muskrat Falls uh, um, the, the reservoir. It has layers and layers of quick clay. It's a uh, clay that it disintegrates under pressure or excess water, and we have asked 
over and over again to have the proper tests done to make sure that that natural dam is going to hold uh, with any, you know, it could be a seismic issue. I don't know if any of you have ever heard about reservoir uh, seismic issues that time's up. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm ready for any questions later and I appreciate y'all listening. Thank you very much.
And I'm not alone in that. There's been about 70 of us from home been arrested. Um, they've sent, you know, there was a picture earlier of Beatrice Hunter, she's a grandmother who, when she refused to stop protesting, the judge sent her over a thousand miles to a maximum security men's prison far away from home for 11 days just because she d said she would not stop protesting the annihilation of her culture. There's a lot, there's so many human rights abuses here. You know, these projects, um, they violate the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in particular. Uh, there, there's just countless issues with these types of things. So what we're here to do is to kind of talk to you a little bit about what we're going through and why, you know, if your state chooses to partner with Hydro-Quebec, that's the kind of thing you're getting involved with here. By purchasing power from Hydro-Quebec and these large-scale dams, that makes you here in Massachusetts complicit in the genocide of my people. So I want you to think about that and think about where the power is coming from and just really take a hard look. Take a hard look at where your power is coming from and know that you can do better and don't sit there and accept, you know, just because these issues and these abuses are happening very far away doesn't mean you can turn your back on it because you are tied to it if you choose to go down to this path. So that's why we're here and that's why we're speaking to you today. Um, I'm really pleased to see a great turnout and look forward to your questions later. I'm here to speak about the environmental damage caused by Manitoba Hydro in uh, Canada. Um, there, you, you'll see here, uh, this is the northern northern Manitoba where the elect, uh, hydroelectric dams are in northern Manitoba. And here uh, you'll see the hydroelectric dams that are in southern Manitoba, those dots dots and the proposed ones that will be coming along. And that's our home flag from our nation. In 1962, this is what our territory looked like. You can see the, uh, the, the rock bottom of, of the lake and rivers um, back then. And that's the same picture around, not the same picture, but around the same time, that's how our water was so clear. And today, this is what we have. Dry land in the summertime and flooding in the winter. That's the same thing here. What you see on the shoreline, there are uh, some sort of uh, green stuff, something, you know, slime and uh, algae and stuff like that. And they stink up the, our community in the summer. This one, of many islands, this tree is the last tree of one island that eroded uh, of one island that eroded away, and these trees submer are submerged, submerged, and at times, a few times, our people died from hitting stuff like these that are submerged underwater. And this is a shoreline of the land land that erodes into the water system. The trees going in and plants going in and the uh, med med medicines go into the system, the things that we use for our healing when we get sick. This is another picture of a drought, I'm not a drought, but in the summertime, that's how our area looks like. When water is kept up on the rivers, uh, up on the well, Lake Winnipeg Reservoir. And another picture of how the land looks like in the summertime. Another one. 
and our fish, our natural food, our nutritious, our, our, our nutritious food of all kinds of species that we use for food is being destroyed by this hydro process. These are not the only food that we have. It's not only fish that we eat. We, eat. we have uh, uh, beavers, well, muskrats, uh, and all kinds of other uh, uh, um, species out there that were healthy for us, but today are contaminated by, by hydro projects that in the contamination of water. And look at this. This is my granddaughter. She's, she likes swimming, but look at the water she's on. Not even six inches under her, you can hardly see her, arm, her, her arms there. That's how our water is so muddy and murky and contaminated and the water is not healthy to drink. You can only imagine way out in, uh, you know, somewhere out on a river system, how our water would look like. You wouldn't see anything in the bottom or you will not see your playmate uh, swimming and so forth, diving and so forth in, within a few inches. And we have, like, uh, like we said, we lost a lot of people. This is a marker where we lost some people when they were um, uh, practicing their traditional pursuits. And that's the same picture. And a lot of families have lost their um, husbands or partners when they're doing their uh, uh, traditional pursuits, trying to practice their economy. That was our economy as well, fishing, hunting, and trapping. And as you can see in this side, uh, we use kiddos. Our people use skidoos now to trap you. They used to use um, a dog team. They can use them now. Because in this picture you see in front of the skidoo there is uh, water that seeps in and out, up and down all winter. And it freezes at some point. And this is a marker that we use where there is a hole on ice. And then this water comes up and down as well. And this is a woman who uh, practices her traditional pursuits. She's uh, five, over five feet, five, five, five tall. This is an example of the uh, ice that layer upon layer, it goes upon layer, layer uh, upon layer, and there are hollows uh, there somewhere. Same thing. That's, yeah, go, same thing. And this is where we live, nine, 10 kilometers downstream. This is the reservoir, the top where the water is, the reservoir where Manitoba Hydro keeps the water and then lets it go in the winter time for them to generate heat, I mean, uh, the electricity, electricity to come here for, to, for you people to use it. And this is the downstream of that dam. So everything is uh, destroyed in our area. It's dangerous for us to use our land. And our economy is lost. When we lost our economy, our hydro bills, we only live uh, 10 kilometers from, uh, uh, from uh, this dam that you saw here. Our hydro bills range anywhere from two, 200 to 400, approximately maybe 600 in the summertime. And in the winter time, they range from approximately approximately four hundred dollars to about twelve twelve thirteen a month, and we pay the price along with our economy being gone, our food being gone, our the nutritional and unhealthy foods that we have we depended on gone, and we pay the price with our lives and the money that we spend on hydro bills. Thank you.
My grandmother taught me about the language, that is the spiritual language that I speak from the heart of the spirit. But it's not the case that I must speak the truth. That is our covenant, the examine to the Great Spirit. What you see in the pictures and what you hear from these people also came up with that. We have a very strong spiritual covenant to our lands because we are indigenous people and we are living in that indigenous land that took care of us for thousands and thousands of years. When we see today the spirit of that people, the spirit of my people die slowly. They die of diabetes, they die of heartbreaks, they die of heart attacks, they die of because of the meat, of the food we eat from that land that used to be very healthy. When you see an elder sign the cross, seeing that land, seeing that woman. I used to work with that old man when I was young. He told me one day, he said to me, you sit, my grandson, I am old. This is my last stand where I'm seeing you today. Now it's your turn. Now you have to walk for your people. Now you have to talk for your people. But always from fear and speak truth. That's why I'm here. I have no degree, but my education is the hardest of education with the degree I got. It's from the elders. I have not passed it. Till the day I leave this world, I will get my degree. And I hope I leave a legacy of a good degree that I fought for my people. I do have a degree from universities, but it's all just what you got in the information that you give you and in the libraries. But the spirit of of that is missing. So I urge you people here to look beyond your studies. Look beyond and see what's going on out there. Who's hurting? While you claim here to have a clean energy, a clean conscious, that you have a clean environment. Remember this. We are all responsible as human beings in this planet. We are all earthlings. Whenever I am red, black, yellow, white, with these are sacred colors, and we need to intertwine and start believing to save this planet, to save the environment, to save the rivers. Because at the end of the day, when your children sit there and watch you, I ask you this question, where were you mom? Where were your dad? Did you listen to those Indians whooping, defending the lands that we drink clean water? They're not protesters. They're defending a land and rivers for everybody. Don't call them protesters. They are sacred people who believe sacredness of our land and our waters. One person said to me that the water has a spirit and it has memories. And one scientist says to me, 99% of our body is full of water. It makes sense that we are the spirit of the waters that flows across our territories, our country. You came, your ancestors came to us 
and establish your own country in my country. Remain peace. Let's not forget who's pleased that we must live together as one people in this country. We are American. I am the original American. I've been here for thousands and thousands of years long before your ancestors came to us. They were, they were persecuted in their homelands. Came to practice your, your religion. Now let's practice the spirituality of our land, our territories, our country, our rivers. Let's not be racist against one another, and then let's provide something for you, for our children, your grandchildren, and theirs. That is our responsibility. That is the most sacred thing we can do. If we have government to God, Sam and Luke, Grace Spirit, Jesus. That's who we are. We cannot question that. We have to believe that. What you see today, if you buy, purchase the energy from our Lord, you are killing us. You are killing the land that we love. You are killing our children. You destroy the water by participating to buy Quebec Hydro or Manitoba Hydro. Somewhere down the line in your conscious mind, you have to question that. Your governments, you have to tell your government because you are the government. You have a responsibility as a government to tell your representatives that you are elect. That you don't want to do that anymore to see things, what they do in here. You are the power. And you have to believe that. If you don't believe that you have the power, and then, us sitting here, it's hopeless. We shouldn't even be sitting here. We should just walk home, forget about it. But you're here because you care. Just you have a heart that you can also speak the truth. Mudek, Lebanon's in Mexico. Walk the trail where it's sacred. Don't stop. Thank you very much.
Thank you for that. Um, I went to school at Memorial University, so the Muskrat, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, the, um, the Muskrat Falls uh, controversy is pretty familiar with me. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about Bill 61 specifically. This was something that I was rallying around while I was at graduate school, so thank you. My numbers are all confused because I'm involved with Bill 69, the new Impact Assessment Act. Bill 61, which one was that? Explain. That's, that's the one with the wind. Yeah, yeah. It's the one that basically gives um, NL Hydro and yeah. Electric a monopoly over the energy sector. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so so what they did is they, um, they passed legislation that made now for energy the only entity in Newfoundland and Labrador that can put any power on the grid. So basically, you can put up a windmill in your uh, front yard if you wish, but there is no way for you to get uh, uh, compensation for the cost of putting up that windmill by selling power back to the grid. It's illegal and it's legislated. So that's what that law says. Um, there's another bill, I, I don't know if you, if you were at Memorial, you would remember it, and I don't know the number of that one either, but it was the legislation that made NALCOR exempt from our Access to Information Act. Do you right. remember that one? No. Well, that was, that's legislated as well. So, as a Crown Corporation owned by the people of the province, like I explained a little while ago, 65 cents, we have to pay for it. No matter what it costs, we ended up having to pay for it, but we are also not allowed to get information that, and NALCOR has the right, their CEO has the right to look at what we ask for under access to information and arbitrarily, without any question from any in, independent group or independent person, they can just cross through what they want to in that document, make it black and say it's proprietary information and nobody can question it. Yeah, the, so Bill 50, oh. the, the other area of that, we did try to get some information regarding Manitoba Hydro in regards to this, uh, their models, what they call it splash model, they able to find exactly how they operate the system that they put across the river, right across the Nelson River, there's about nine times right across the river where we live, and we asked them for information. They gave us the information after we went to court and when we got the information, most of everything is just black right, right across the, uh, the word documentation. But we had people from here in Massachusetts who actually went to do a search, research for us to find out exactly what is this document that's been black -lighted. Guess what? It was readily available to the public of Massachusetts. <laughs> wow. So we got the, the clean document and then to go back to Manitoba Hydro, I said, let's see yours. So they back away from all that. So this is what's going on in Manitoba Hydro in Quebec Hydro is that they don't give you the information, but they will give you the information that looks good. But what happens is, what what is the level of wars in these particular areas? That's what information needs to be learned, and that's what's going on over here with these soft pictures and everything, because that information was never given to the people who actually live with that. Yeah, and, and so that all kind of speaks to just how, um, you know, unaccountable and, and untransparent these processes are with these companies that are building these mega dams. Um, and so specifically with Bill 61, to answer your question, Basically, this bill makes it so that it's essentially illegal to have any wind power in Newfoundland. That's my friend uh, Nick is doing a PhD specifically on this question. So the province of Newfoundland and Labrador has the highest potential wind energy in all of Canada, and we can actually produce, um, he says, 117 times the amount of power that we would need, and we have the lowest uh, installed capacity of wind power in the country because of this bill, so it's, it's, you know, it's essentially illegal. What we have is a province who's, you know, bankrupting us 
by making these giant mega dams that are destroying our, our rivers, destroying our forests, destroying our cultures, they're you know, making it impossible to build wind, solar's not an option because of our weather, and then on top of that, they're also looking to double our offshore oil. So it's all connected, right? Like it's not just these mega dams, it's also the, you know, the politics that come with it um, and in particular, I think the doubling of the offshore oil to pay to essentially pay for the mega dam that they can't afford, and now they're thinking of building a third one, right? So it's not just you know there's there's so many kind of aspects to what they're doing and how horrible it all is, and that's just like just another example of why these this whole thing is absolutely absurd, and it cannot be you know the solution to the climate crisis. Can't think of that because it doesn't make any sense. I have a, I have a question. I can yell it. Okay. Um, like when we leave here tonight, what is the number one thing that you want us that, that we can help, like make an impact? Like when we're leaving here, like what is the number one thing we got to do? My other question is, have you reached out? Is other tribes helping you on this? Because I'm a Cherokee Nation citizen, and I think I met you at day morning. Remember? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like our other tribes, like do you have an inner tribal thing going that's helping with this? Yeah, so um, I would say leaving here, put pressure on your governor and all, you know, I guess all levels of government. I'm not super familiar in how things work. Put pressure on your government to ensure that, you know, this is not being imported here in Massachusetts or anywhere in the state. about the folks in Maine who are trying to stop the transmission border. So that's one of the things that we're doing is we figure if we can cut off the markets here in the US, then they, at least they won't be able to build any new dams. So that's one of our strategies. So helping out the um, Alliance um, Conference in Winnipeg. It's an uh, Indigenous-led alliance of hydro-impacted communities and started off in Manitoba. And it's involved Indigenous communities and other frontline activists from around the world. But also, I know there, I think there's some 350.org people here. You know, we're talking about a just transition and climate justice and the Green New Deal, for example, some of the versions that we're seeing do not explicitly exclude large hydro. So it's really important for us to focus on that legislation and instead of just reading these things that it builds around, really look at what is in there when it comes to large hydro and nuclear and some of the other things that are being portrayed as false solutions to the climate crisis. So drilling down on that legislation, I think is really important. Uh, just the other thing you need to uh, enable to put pressure on your, uh, on your government's work. We did, my, my, my wife and myself, on the first half, of the first march to the legislature to demand uh, respect and uh, to give us uh, at least something to uh, actually see what's going on with Dams. They didn't give us very much uh, information. So in the end, around about what, October 24, we decided, uh, she decided to say, to me, he said, let's go. And I said, where? I said, let's go to Jackie. And I said, why? <coughs> September. Uh, he said, let's go kick them out. Can I just jump in just so people know what Jenteg is? Jenteg is, uh, is the uh, is, it's a control, control dam that controls Lake Winnipeg. The moon giant, uh, you can use Lake Winnipeg as a reservoir, uh, including Lake Manitoba that will spill into the Lake Winnipeg. It stops here. Okay? We live down here. Okay? And there are also, there are also other, uh, other hydro dams along the side that powers this lake, all the other dams. So we're here. So we went over here to pick everybody out, to go home. That's one of the things that need to be, because it is still indigenous land, okay? That we have to understand that, okay? So we went there and they left for the money. And I think we brought the government down to his knees and was trying to negotiate a better deal. And uh, that's another thing. Uh, 
Og nu vil de os. Behøves nu givet eller trovse. It's about responsibility. Taking care of the land. And when you do that, basically what it means, you're taking care of your children in a long, long ways in the future. Your children will be appreciated if you do that. something about resistance, and, I'm, and Amy is probably a better one to even talk about this than me, but I, I have to say that resistance for 27,000 people in a territory the size of Texas that's scattered over 20 communities, it's pretty tough for us to resist, and I, actually um, within minutes after um, uh, 60 people went on the site, we shut it down at Muskrat Falls, and I'm sure our friend here that went to school at Memorial probably heard about this. They shut the site down solid for five weeks, uh, sorry, five days. And, but just as fast as that happened, now for was at the courts and had an injunction against everyone. We couldn't come within one kilometer of the gates of that place. And it was an immediate, it was done on a Sunday night. The judge was dragged out of his house, whatever, we don't know, but on Sunday night he signed an immediate injunction. And there's been, what, $20,000, $25,000, $30,000 that we baked cakes and cookies and sold slippers and whatever else we had to do in order to gather the money to help these guys pay the lawyers um, to, to get them through the courts. And they've been dragged through the courts for what, three years now, almost three years. So when it comes to, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so this is, this is because, um, you know, indigenous resistance to these types of extraction projects. You know, we're over criminalized, so there's been about 70 of us who've faced charges, been arrested, that sort of thing. Um, you know, this, the majority of the arrests happened in the, <clears throat> the fall of 2016. A lot of folks are still in court. Mine was only wrapped up a couple months ago. We're still paying off our $30,000 legal fees. So that's like just another, you know, another line of injustices in terms of these mega projects. Because this sort of thing happens anytime there's Know, these unjust um, projects in indigenous lands. It, um, so yeah, we're still uh, fundraising. If you have any extra money to send our way, I'm glad you passed something class to link along. That's just another thing. Um, when we went to, to that camp, that uh, JP camp, there, there was a picture that I showed you in there, the, uh, with the high level, can you go for now? Um, uh, where there's water that's higher on, on one side, and there's the dam, and there's the water that's lower there. We went to that dam, and we said to Manitoba Hydro, this is our land, okay? It is our land, and we are here to stay. And then they started, the uh, corporation started uh, sending uh, RCMP there, and we told Manitoba, told the RCMP, we are not doing anything wrong. We are here, we are just sitting here to tell that we own this land and that Manitoba Hydro is destroying our land, uh, our land and our people. And um, they tried to take us to court. They couldn't, you, you talk about it. So Manitoba Hydro and the province of Manitoba, including Canada, uh, put a court injunction that we should not be there in our own uh, in our land, but where the where gentry exists. So we proceeded to get up, and there was uh, a former Supreme Court judge was sitting there as a mediator. So Manitoba Hydro and the province of Manitoba and Canada also were all sitting there with their with their lawyers. Uh, we have a lawyer too, but we didn't feel very much already we had very interested in, in our lawyers at that time already. So we got up and I said, so we got, we started going into the room at the boardroom, but what well, the, uh, the former Supreme Court judge says, we are they doing? And we said it loud. So we're going home. We're gonna shut the lights off. And he says, where? Manitoba. There's a reason why we said that. All of the transmission lines in our territory push across our indigenous land. 
the 2543 that would go through the Amazon to sell that power to Northern States power, and Northern States is basically saying fall like any office. Because <clears throat> we cannot rely on the courts anymore. Your courts and your laws reflect who you are, but it does not reflect to us who we are as a race, as people. <clears throat> Your lawyers, your, your judges, reflect to you. It's basically called a very, very strong privilege to have that freedom. So we don't do that anymore. We go where the dams are, and we sit there, and we build villages in there when we have them. Because two thousands of our people over there, including back are homeless. So these are the things we you people have to realize about the <coughs> government buying and purchasing hydropower, uh, prepared hydropower. To make you feel that you have a clean energy. These transmission lines are pushed across to your state as blood, death, cultural genocide, and you call it clean. I don't think so. Uh, in the UAM, these corporations call and your government, uh, your, the corporations and the governments of the United States and Canada call this energy clean and green, and they hide, they hide behind closed doors when they're talking about them, and they hide the information from the general public, whether it is in Canada or whether it is in the United States, and we know about it, that those are the kind of resistances that we are doing as we speak out on clean and green environment for us, but for them, what they use is not clean, nor is it green. So with the resistance that we, that we use, in our territory, it it helps. We can live on somebody else's um, determination. We live on our determination, and we keep pushing it. Yes, we do have a hard time. Yes, all the time we do have a hard time with governments and corporations, but we still go on, and they see what some, how some people resist these uh, kind of abuses. This is mental abuse, this is emotional abuse, this is physical abuse at times, and this is definitely spiritual abuse because the connection to the land that indigenous people have is real. The spiritual connection that indigenous, indigenous people have to the air is real, water, soil, land, every, every element of this earth is sacred to our people and we hope to promote, we hope to tell the rest of the world that what we're going through right now, including the people of the United States, the, South um, United States, Canada, it's real. And there's no way of eliminating it now. The only type of elimination that we will be able to give is to pay more attention to how much governments and how much corporation or any industry is using the land to destroy it because it's, it, it, it's climate change. Changes the climate. We notice that already in our own area, in our own uh, territory. So when we when we go home, when we go home tonight, which I won't be going home, but I'll think about my my children and my grandchildren, <clears throat> and I'll tell them, look, I love you. I want to protect you. I want to protect this land. I want to protect this water for you. My children, my grandchildren, I will do that. So 
So when we get home, this is their future that we're protecting now. So think about that every day, every day. I, I think about that, honest to God, I think about it every day before I go to school. We have to protect this uh, earth. It is our duty. It is our responsibility. It is a sacred duty that we protect land and water for our future generations. It always comes from the heart when I say that. It's not only me. Honestly. Yes. That's true.
the, the other excuse, I mean, the other information that we get a lot of trouble high with the reason why we get very high in bills is because we have a low density population. But basically, there's fewer people in there, so we have to check out the prices to protect your uh, hydropower in your communities. While in Winnipeg, our, our hydro bill is around about 800 bucks in, a, in, a, in, in winter. Uh, it was around about two hundred dollars in the summer. So we lived in Winnipeg. Our hydro bill was hundred bucks a month. Now, as you go down from that, where the hydro is actually being produced and where it's being coming down to the Southeast Asia, it gets cheaper, and it gets cheaper down in the United States, where St. Paul, Minneapolis, where a friend of ours lived, her bill is around fifty bucks a month. So what she says is that who is actually paying the price for all this, all this mess? We are. When you talk about the hydro payment, of hydro payment rebellion of Cross Lake, there's an article that you can read about in the journal of Cultural Survival. I think that Tommy and Rita have something to do with that. Anyway, we established a particular law under the Village of American Governors. We call it hydro payment law and trust. But basically, we encourage our people to pay their hydro bills to the trust, not to the hydro itself. So it went along very fine for at least a year. So finally, we, um, but there's politics going on at the same time, okay? So there's a politics between the province and politics between the Manitoba Hydro. Actually, the cash cow of the government is actually Manitoba Hydro. Okay? So there's politics on this side, there's also politics in our community. So there's also pro hydro people in our community. Okay? So anyway, we did this, which went very well because we were able to establish a war chest, we were able to campaign the truth of campaign all across Canada. Okay? So they took it to court. And because nobody was there to challenge the court proceedings regarding our trust payment law. Actually, Manitoba had to actually took back the $2 million that was put in the trust. I said to them, bad move. Right? So we were able, for, able to come back and challenge that. We said to our people, don't pay your hydro bills at all. Because uh, they owe us money, a lot of it, for using our land for free for the last 45 years. Uh, they have to pay back. But anyway, so they decided to take our hydro bills to the collection agency to make us look bad. So we did the same thing. We sent a bill about $500 million to the collection agency. <laughs> Then we told them, this, and we know, see, if you guys go smart enough to go to New York, where they borrow money to build these dams, it's called, and they get a credit rating from the Standard and Poor. And I was standing in, out there yesterday, looking at a stock exchange. And my mind was just going, <laughs> I was very, very attentive to go look for people that are there who are actually loaning these hydro dams probably Quebec, hydro, okay? So, but the possibility is still there if this doesn't stop. That eventually somewhere down the line in Manitoba hydro, we, we think this strategy about, okay, let's listen to these people. That's what we're up against. Me, I gotta enjoy. Mm -hmm. I think I gotta be, reinvigorated as a, a young rebellious guy. <laughs> Even though I'm 66 years old, but I live with a troublemaker. <laughs> so I have to be a troublemaker too. <laughs> A bunch of us are here. We're just in a meeting in Boston talking to our governor officials. They 
We fought for three years to save the oldest forest in our state forest, and they ignored multiple stated policies and procedures and broke multiple laws, and they're not listening to us either. Even though we got like 1,400 signatures on a petition, we've, we've been fighting this for three years, and our 100-year-old our forest is now a moonscape. So one of the things that we've found has been effective is petitions and a sign-on letter. And what we've been advised is that unless we can bring this information to Boston in front of Baker and embarrass him in Boston, um, you know, I mean, that's when they listen is when they might not win the next election. So if you could speak from your heart so that, and, and create a sign-on letter, that's what a lot is happening a lot. We're getting a lot of sign-on letters. But I wouldn't know how to speak for you, and I would love to have a letter that was written by you that frames what you want, and then we would have something to go viral and we can sign on to that sign-on letter. And when, you know, that's part of our Constitution is minimum 10 citizens um, in Massachusetts state uh, constitution means that our public officials to our, are, are accountable to us at all times. That's Article 5 of the Massachusetts Constitution. But we need minimum 10. That was a Supreme Judicial Court decision. So a sign-on letter that has 100, 200, 500, 1,000, then they know that the sovereign is speaking to them because we're sovereign citizens. Great, thank you very much. We will be going to the Department of Energy Resources next week. We have a meeting there. That'll be our second meeting with the Baker administration talking about this. And I um, do want to put in a plug for the 50th annual National Day of Morning in Plymouth. That's kind of the impetus for our tour. This will be the third year that our indigenous speakers are there with um, people from all over the world talking about indigenous rights. And that's in Plymouth, Mass on Thanksgiving Day. And we'll be there with our Mega Band, Mega Band banner and um, love to see you there too. And we do have um, the donate page on our website and we're on Facebook as I mentioned. And appreciate all your ideas and would love to work together and build alliances. Can you take another question? Hi, thank you all, and uh, Amy, I'd like to ask you if you have anything that you would like to say to young people about how they can actually contribute to a good way. And um, just also want to uh, honor your experience and your courage and the risks that you are taking and that the truth that you spoke tonight. You know, in terms of like the climate crisis, the most impacted communities are indigenous communities and northern communities. Mm -hmm. So the solution to the climate crisis, you know, can't also disproportionately affect these communities. That makes no sense. I think, um, you know, any type of movement that's looking at addressing cli the climate crisis, any type of energy issues, this sort of thing, especially with young people, but anyone in general, you, I think it's critical to listen to indigenous voices and lift up those voices that you don't always hear from. Um, because, you know, this is indigenous land and we need to honor that uh, no matter where you are. So I think, you know, honoring the people whose land you're on, uh, uplifting their voices and their concerns and supporting them is going to get our movements, you know, it, it, that's going to do great things. That kind of answers your question, I guess. Thank you. Last words? Mm -hmm.